Good morning from India. Good evening from Australia. Thank you for joining us today. And on our platform, we have Ms. Tatiana Bilbao. Good morning, India. <laughs> it's a, a very good um, pleasure and honor to be here with you. My name is Tatiana Bilbao, and I am an architect based in Mexico City, uh, where I was born and raised, studied, based, etc. <laughs> What would you deem as the beginning of your journey as an architect? Is there a specific moment or a project that started your journey as an architect? Um, I think, as my father he well said one when I told him that I wanted to do architecture, that I had it in my blood. Because in my family, there are a lot of architects. I mean, it's the, it's the obvious choice. So I don't... I don't know if I could um, determine a moment. I truly think I I had it inside. Uh, since I was very little, I I I always have. Uh, I was always very aware of the built environment around me. Very aware. I was always since very very. I'm. I barely could walk, could speak, and I could point at where things were around me you know, in, in my neighborhood, in my city. So I think, yeah, I was an architect. <laughs> you have previously previously worked as an advisor in the Ministry of Development and the housing of the government of the Federal District of Mexico City. Has that experience influenced uh, your work and your practice? It did very much because, um, well, I, would, I must say that I was always interested in the production of space and how the space was produced um, in different ways. In, in our city, is very, um, it's, it's produced in a very civic way, meaning that it really is produced by the people, you know, rather than... Um, so in our... Basically, in India happens a lot of the same things, no? That uh, the city, the spaces, the civic space is produced by the people. And then the, the government arrives and provides um, kind of the, the, the basic infrastructure afterwards. So it's a little bit opposite, no? And what the canon says. I understood that in the Minister of... In, in those governmental instances, at least in Mexico, it's hard to do anything other than bureaucratic work. And basically, I think uh, the, the political needs are too, um, too necessary for those people who arrive there to still continue in power or to hold power. So I, I was disappointed, I must, I must say, about... Um, the little possibilities of really working for the citizens and for the for the real um, needs and and yeah, I was more innocent. I think I, I when I when I entered there, I was twenty four, and I really thought that that was a place where you know like real good governments would think of people first. Now it's like everywhere in the world, and it 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 is not that. And I saw that mainly, basically, the main players, no, who really play a role in um, community making, let's say, or community uh, consolidating, or whatever, and housing and everything, were architects or uh, academic people that were operating from the private sector. So I said, you know, that's me. I really wanna. Uh, I really want to participate in the production of space, so I would uh, go and do my private uh, my private work in my private practice and hoping to work publicly, and that's what I did. Well, has the has the intervention of profession like yourself and 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 the, the creative in, intervention from from profession like yourself in the Mexico City has changed the outlook the way authorities have started looking at developing the built environment? No, I don't think um, I have had that impact. I wish. <laughs> I wish I have had that impact. I try. I have like really been always very keen on also trying to be political. 
but it's um it's something that is very very it it surpasses all the possible um lines i could have influence on uh but but yeah that doesn't mean i won't keep trying <laughs> and i won't keep not knock, knocking doors and making uh kind of um also political advocacy in the level i can no just taking off from that i had a question about the scales you work at you also mentioned you know what are the canons and you know creating impact through in have as you said private practice but how much of that um could you talk a little bit about your process actually uh with these different scales i mean including the project i assume you're in melbourne for right now which is the installation could you talk us through some of the different processes of of how you work with scale we work in very different ranges of scales um i won't say that the the they are so different uh but of course they are if you think that we are exactly here for a a small provo provocative installation and a museum no uh but also we uh, i came from um a workshop with the monks uh, of the monastery that we're doing in germany no or um yeah i had a call a zoom this morning for a project we're doing in in austin you know so i think that there are uh several different it it could be seen as very schizophrenic from the exterior but because they sound very different but they are all operating in the same place which for me is one one basic thing that i understand is um and paraphrasing the words of professor elke krasny is uh i really believe that architecture is uh pr provides a basic form of care um and even more than basic primary form of care oh no? that's exactly the word she uses and i really um, um for me that that sentence is very much uh close to my thoughts because um i have always thought of architecture as being that no the, the first layer or the second because our first layer is the clothes second layer of protection from the inclemencies of the weather which we cannot survive with um and not only that for me like the whole definition of architecture is really that that provides that primary form of care um in uh, that contains you know that primary form of care for me is we have as humans uh not only um demonstrated that caves are not enough you no know, that we need spaces that enhance our life so it protects our life but also enhances it and enhancing doesn't mean necessarily i mean kind of these uh, more let's say luxurious word or luxurious word of um uh, that comes from enhancement it's literally that no we need a space that it's able to allow us to build our lives thinking off from that question which devanshi asked uh, you've been heard saying and quoting at various platforms that an architecture an architect should be able to affect um every human being life irrespective of the scales diversities and the personalities um which we are catering to um today where we are given the climate uh, changes which are happening in our in our uh, lives um besides addressing human needs uh, have we scaled up to start thinking or talking about other living organisms and species uh which needs to coexist with us and we need to coexist with them well i i have been thinking that in the sake of that protection and the the and comfort health comfort etc um the evolution of society has really provoked our kind of the attachment from the ecosystem that we belong no so we do need certain protection but uh, the extreme in which we are now living is preventing us even to realize that we are part of the ecosystem no right. and we think that we 
should understand how to um, kind of save nature or destroy, or we speak about destruction or we speak about, yeah. I, I think much more is that we are alienating ourselves from the ecosystem that we uh, are part of. And that obviously is making that ecosystem very mad <laughs> and is almost going is almost on the verge of expelling us from that from there the only the only species uh, well unfortunately some of them also will come with us that would disappear is us from this planet if we continue if we continue playing the game that we don't belong to this ecosystem nor that we are apart from that even the way we talk no we we talk about humans and nature um, no, uh, how do we protect nature? How do we dominate it? How do we destroy it? We are part of, we're nature, no? So we are doing that. Um, and we don't talk about that as if we were part of it. And um, yeah, so I, I wanna, I try to think all the, the, the architecture that I do uh, that we could, with it, you know, kind of make statements of that possibility, you know. Um, and I, I normally, to explain this, I always uh, put an extreme, but there, there are bodies in this planet that live, are born and die, you know, and th their whole life transgress in 22 degrees centigrade. This is an extreme, but there's these extremes in, in society. And uh, I, I could point where exactly, you can imagine where they are, um, where people really are always in spaces that are 22 degrees, regardless of what temperature is outside. It could be minus 40 or it could be plus 40, that they are 22 degrees, no? So they're in their house, it's 22 degrees, they go in their cars, it's 22 degrees because also that is the urbanism, they are very barely in the exterior. No, then they go into the office, they're 22 degrees. Then they go into the shopping mall, they're 22 degrees. They could return to their house, 22 degrees. And these bodies really, when they are exposed for longer periods of time for in the weather, in the just in the normal weather, they get sick. They're getting disadapted no? and they truly get sick. Yep. They're getting disadapted from the ecosystem where like architecture is the culprit of that. They're well, obviously, a whole system of uh, the societal system, no, and how those uh, cities are laid down. But, but definitely, it's a problem of architecture, no, in the sake of protection, of comfort, of progress, of um, sanitation, in a way, no. So, um, I mean, that's an extreme, but it exists in the world today, right? So, um, and many of other countries are following that direction of, uh, of progress. Um, so I think that we architects should be very aware of it. You know? What are we doing to society with the architecture that we're doing? Exactly. I mean, it's, this conversation can easily be titled as life beyond 22 degrees centigrade. You know. <laughs> <laughs> How, Life how beyond you, 22 degrees, I like it. <laughs> um, so you have mentioned that the studio works with uh, hand drawings and iterative models uh, with an aim to retain spatial exploration. Uh, but with the introduction of new digital tools and now, you know, applications like Mid Journey, DALI, etc., that actually explore design through AI, do you feel a pressure to move to these kind of digital explorations? You know, I think that I... I I think of the digital world as um, as a tool to um, that could help in in a, at some point the process of uh, the creation of spaces. Um, but I believe that the the world is physical and that the experience of uh, of it is physical. And we humans need this physical world because we exist in this physical world to live. So I am much more um, centered in the 
practical um, mode of keeping myself there. I mean, I respect whoever does other things. And being there and understanding and having that understanding for the basis of my practice, I truly think that um, I need to always be in physical contact to the things that I do. Um, I also, for me, it's very difficult to translate ideas uh, to build a physical environment in, and then filter them in a digital one. Uh, for me, it's the other way around. I need to the translation of those ideas in my head of a physical space need to be translated physically, you know, into something that is done manually also with the hands because I think that process uh, of um, becoming it physical, it then is easier to relate to a physical scale. And then we use these digital tools to uh, help us to communicate them, to uh, translate them, to even be able to then create this possibility of building them. Co-creation has, has taken a huge uh, step ahead because, and that is a fairly strong need. So what have, have you done any projects or have you been part of initiatives where co-creation and collaboration have much more stronger meaning beyond just designing in a silo? Almost every every project that we have done is, um, a, I would say not almost, every project that we have done is done collectively. And it's done collectively, not only um, in terms of the being that in the office, which is very diverse. It's also a, that it, we really share this uh, with different fields, different people. The, uh, the, uh, and the, for me, it's because architecture is a collective act and um, architecture is spatial and we shouldn't, we should think that they should be architectures and not architects, no? We should all be architects. We should all be architects of our own life in this planet. So um, I think that the more uh, minds, the more possibilities of really uh, um, uh, creating spaces for more people, for sure. The more diverse minds also because that's the way to respond to a very diverse uh, world so in addition to architectural and urban projects uh, the practice has also been involved in uh, exhibitions uh, and in fact you know i wrote on one of these exhibitions but can you explain how the design process for, for an exhibition is different for a typically architectural or urban project well we we basically, um, probably these in the NDB or the one you wrote for are uh, the, the two exhibitions, the only two exhibitions since we started that we have done kind of as an architecture because the other ones have been much more um, about uh, self-reflections on our work, you know? And, uh, but therefore we also needed to understand how to, to do those, no? But um, in this case of the Danish, Danish Architecture Center here in Melbourne in the NGB, it, it, it is about an architecture shown in a museum, no? So um, the process for that is, um, well, I think the process could be named as the same, no? Is always thinking on ideas um, collectively and then when we have ideas in our heads on what is what the questions we want to pose uh, with those projects, because that's normally how we think of, on anything. You know, what are the questions we want to we want to provoke with these projects, or what are the the questions we want to um, we want to really what is the questions that are going to emerge from this project, and um, eh, and then we start like putting them down physically in or in written or in collage or in drawing or in model. And then from there starts the evolution of the 
of the project uh, through conversations with everything, everyone that we can involve, the more the merrier. And yeah, but I would say basically it's the same process you know, as a project. The ones that have been different is those who are exhibitions of our work. So it's more self-reflective and that's harder normally. You know, I wish they they would only be done by curators because it's very hard to do those reflections on your work by yourself. In today's time, the, um, the exhibition uh, also needs to question, you know, and uh, it needs to question uh, where we are today and where we need to go tomorrow. So what's next for, for Tatiana Bilbao? And what's the next question from you for the community? <laughs> For me, the next question is what what the 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 the, the question that it, we have been hearing no these past two years is what is the post COVID city? Uh, for me, that is not the question. For me, the question is what is the post carbon formed city, um, uh, or what is the city of care? For me, that's the future city, and um, what is next in in our in our plate, let's say, um, we we are doing a, a monastery in Germany, and this is a lifetime project that will be next for us for the next life, even. <laughs> well, we look forward to that uh, uh, coming across, and it'll be great. Me for too. To be I'm very much looking uh, forward to that project. Awesome. Great, thank you. Thank you, uh, Tatan. I hope you enjoyed talking to us as much as we did. Very much. And, yes, uh, thank you so much.